Live from Zephyr One, this is Derailed Trains of Thought. Hello, Tim. Hello, Nicholas. We are in the air. It's unusual for us to be en route to somewhere, usually when we're just kind of stationary. Yeah, I'm hoping when we're en route to somewhere nice and not like somewhere where there's fighting or monsters or Mm -hmm. something. Oh, I mean, we're kind of huddled back in like this loading area, I'm guessing. Yeah. There's a really nice car over there, though. It's a Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they're just delivering for an auction or something. Oh, that that could be. Maybe. I know there's that weird like container over there. It looks like a nice room. Yeah. I mean, but... Yeah, it might be a quiet place for us to record if we need. Oh, that's a good idea. If if we get into some turbulence, we'll we'll keep that in mind. Okay, sounds good. So you get air sickness? Not bad. No. Okay, I should be good. Okay, as long as there's no free falling, I'll be good. (laughs) That's well, yeah. I should hope not. Well, I never know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, whoever owns this plane, they have got a great sense of branding. They've got that that eagle thing all over the it, place. It's, it's, I feel like we're in America. Yes, yes. We're, we should be in, in good hands. Yes. But anyway, welcome, folks, to uh, the Royal Trains of Thought. This is your premier podcast on storytelling. For the creator and the consumer, all kinds of storytelling is uh, examined here, talked about, discussed. Dissected, padded, <laughs> sent to bed. <laughs> uh, enjoyed, cherished. In um, other words, uh, humored. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I think storytelling humors us. <laughs> well, yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> but in case you've never listened, um, again, my name is Timothy Deal. I'm the uh, video slash media guy. My name is Nick Hayden. I am the writer dude. <laughs> the writer dude. Yes. And we're here to regale you with our conversation. So, Tim, let's go to our story school. So, Tim, it's October. It is. We're not actually doing a Halloween episode, but some parts of this might apply to horror movies. The scary stuff. Scary stuff. So what's we're, our topic? We're going to talk about doubles in fiction. Double who? No. Well, sometimes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but doubles, uh, doppelgangers, Man, clones. I, I remember when we were in the realm of derailed thoughts, I had a weird dream about seeing ourselves. I, yeah, I there was know. an outrigger. Yeah, well, what was with the outrigger I thing? Know. I hope we find out sometime. Yeah, we really need an answer to that question. Yeah, it's vital. Yeah. Anyway, so we're going to be talking basically lookalikes, clones, LMDs, dark versions of yourself, etc. Upside down versions of yourself. All that stuff. All that stuff. Which there's actually a surprising number of different categories for seeing an, an alternate version of yourself. Yeah, in, first we're like, stories. Oh, we thought, oh, that'd be interesting. Then I was thought about it, like, there's a lot of ver- ways people use this in fiction. So we kind of split up into three basic, for our own use, ways. First, we'll talk about lookalikes. Not actual doubles, doubles just sort of the Prince and the Pauper thing. Hey, we'll switch places. Oh, you look like me. We'll experience each other's world for a little bit. I get to be in royalty. The other person gets to experience common life. Or something like the parent trap. (laughs) Yeah, where it's like, hey, I'm going to experience your family, you're experience mine, then we're going to be one family. And it just turns out, oh, we're actually twins. Oh, how'd that happen? Yeah. Or like um, Tale of Two Cities, you got Charles Darnay and Sidney Carton, and near the end, they use that so they can switch, and one takes the other's death, you know, place of his guillotining. Yes, execution. Execution. And so in the lookalike, a lot of times it's used for kind of a compare-contrast sort of thing. Like, let me enter a new world and go and be the fish out of water sort of thing. And sometimes I get into shenanigans when people think I'm another person mm-hmm. and I'm acting a lot differently than I used to before. And so, yeah, it, it highlights the differences between two people very quickly. And it's usually used for a relatively humorous effect. I mean, not always, but I mean, parent tra- you know, there's a lot of uh, interesting setups like wait, you didn't used to do that, and what is going on here? And I guess another variation of this is in, like, spy things, like Mission Impossible, the masks. Oh, that's true, yeah. You were, it's, It could be an in- infiltration thing. The other person is not really uh, a party to uh, the, the lookalike. So really, it's like you're pretending to be a person that you're not, and it just happens physically you have a good appearance. Yeah. In that case, it's, it's less about, like, 
fun character shenanigans and more about we've got to fool these people so I can get into this. Although sometimes, every now and then, probably Alias, if I remember, I might have had some interesting stories about pretending to be someone else. I, I wonder when you're writing that, kind of the the plot device you have is the is the discrepancy in knowledge. Mm. You're in a... a you're in a place where everyone knows you, but you don't know all the context for what's happening. Or you may know some of it, but not some all of it. of it. So it adds adds tension. Mm-hmm. You're playing dramatically. You know, Mission Possible, it's that sort of like, oh, no, am I going to say the wrong thing? Is he going to recognize I'm not actually his brother? You know, sort of mm-hmm. thing. And then in, in the humor, it's, it plays the that, that sort of tension, like, oh, they're going to find out any moment now yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, there's even the humorous moments, there's a bit of suspense of the anticipation trying to see what they're what's going to happen exactly. And when's the shoe going to drop? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because in those things, you always know at some point it's going to be found out that they're not the real thing, the real McCoy. Right. But when and where, and yeah, and it's just fun to see the antics that happen when people don't know. And it seems like this happens more in, uh, not more, but you know, in kind of traditional like plays, operas sort of thing, where you just have mistaken identities Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sort of thing. So that's kind of your basic. They're not quite doubles, but they're close enough. Yeah. And it's it's been used a lot throughout history. Classic. Classic. It's class. It's mint. (laughs) Um, Then there's kind of the replacement. Define. I'm going to try to attempt to define. This is, I think this is used largely in visual media. I have examples, and then maybe we can get a definition. Okay. So we watched the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. a lot. Uh-huh. We talked about that last time. Yeah. That Agent Coulson died, mm-hmm. and then he comes back because, well, kind of. Well, sort of. It's yeah, not it's, actually the same guy. It's like a being that took on, uh, how do you even explain this? It wasn't like an alternate version. It was more like... It, it was created through weird magical artifacts. Yeah. From his memories. Yeah, based, Yes. An avatar creature based on his memories, essentially. Well, this happens in sci-fi sometimes where, you know, you'll make a replacement robot of somebody. Mm. Or you'll, you'll um, I don't know, it's, it's like the physical, you're purposely making a double of someone. So maybe replacement's not the right thing. Maybe it's just clones. You know, you're purposely saying, I need a version of this guy through some other means. Mm-hmm. Whether it's physically cloning, whether it's making a lifelike robot. Whether it's you know through some magical artifacts, mm-hmm. it's through a dream realm. Once upon a time, had this. <laughs> we won't try to explain this dream realm where Robin Hood died. Wish realm. Wish realm. Realm. W- wish realm. There you go. Thank you. Toy boat. Um, <laughs> that anyways, Robin Hood died, and then this wish realm, Robin Hood was there. It wasn't the same Robin Hood because it was a pre other things. Someone made a wish and it created this whole like alternate world. And at first they just acted, oh, it's just a wish. This isn't real. And then later like, no, this whole world that was created by a wish is real. And it's like this new alternate version of everything. It got weird. And alternate realities have some of this. You know, if you, you know, you can get, oh, it's my version from this world and I'm different because. Mm. Or a person of interest had the sort of like the computer working out. Oh, what their lives would have been, simulation what their life would have been. Mm-hmm. And I think in lots of cases, these are sort of used by writers to to examine a character. What makes the character tick? What makes the character tick? How would they have been different if different circumstances had come into play? Or in a, if if you going into the alternate world setting in a completely different kind of world, yeah. what would they be like? And for the reader sometimes, like this with the Coulson thing, like they're like, oh, we made a... okay. So I've been watching the Shield. It's nuts. So Coulson dies. This magical artifact makes a version of him based on his memory. Memories, I guess. It was then that one dies, and then they take his memories from that thing. fake thing and put it into a robot. Right? Am I am I correct I, here? I think you're right. Yeah. Okay. And this is now Coulson. And I mean, this is the last bit was at the season finale. So we don't really know how LMD Coulson is going to play out. Yet. LMD meaning life model decoy. Yeah, it's a Marvel term that they had. They had explored LMDs in a previous season, but that was mainly a, like a robot storyline. Yeah. They were doubles, but they're like essentially evil robots. Yeah, they're assassins or whatever. Yeah, yeah. They just had the face and could act like it, but they were, yeah, they were just robots out to kill people but it adds and i'm sure this happens which in, is cool it's like you know you never know who's who's the well, real person and who's the fake there was a good there was a great episode where it's like there's so many doubles running around yeah it, it was, was a lot of tension it was like, fun again a good example of our look-alike tension that's you know, true like 
wait, is that the spy or not? Yeah. <laughs> it's like if you watch, um, is in the books too, but it's great in the Lemony Snicket Netflix where there's um, the Dewey brothers. And you don't know, there was one good one and there's one bad one. They look exactly the same mm. in Penultimate Peril. Okay. Oh, but the, the, the philosophical problem then would say this Coulson, do memories make the same person? Is alternate reality really the same person? Yeah. And I think this is something that some hard sci-fi has wrestled with. But something that doesn't actually get talked about very much in genre, like, especially TV movie stuff. Mm -hmm. And like in Doctor Who, David Tennant, Hand, turned into a new version of himself that they're like, hey, Rose, you can go love this one now. (laughs) It's like, does your genetics determine who you are? Who you you are? Do your memories, you know, if, if your memories get downloaded into a computer, are you the same thing just because your memories are there? I, and this is something that's interesting to wrestle with. Yeah. I, I mean, have my own answers, but I mean, through fiction, you can wrestle with these things. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's a similar question to when does life begin? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When your hand gets chopped off and turned into a, an alternate version of yourself, does that mean a, a, a duplicate of your soul go, <laughs> is, is in that person? I mean, yes, a sci fiction like show, show like Doctor Who is probably not going to actually delve into a soul whether now, a soul actually and exists. so much is they're so they're tied in largely to like genetics determines right stuff so in that case i don't know and which is a, kind of weird if like if all you are is just a product of genetics and circumstance yeah then are we really that much different than robots well and that's what comes up in in some ways in do androids dream of electric sheep by philip k dick the androids are basically exactly the same as humans but Humans hunt down androids, but they look the same, they feel, and they're trying to have relationships, and half the time you can't tell the difference at all, and mm-hmm. and it's kind of a freaky book in that way. Yeah. But then the question, or even to a lesser extent, Battlestar Galactica, the best of the Cylons were basically just humans that used to be robots. I mean, I technically still are, but there was physically, there was literally no difference, so they're like, mm-hmm. what are we? Yeah. I think... Uh- it's been a long time since I've seen it, but I think Blade Runner is a similar question. Well, that oh, would be based off the... Is that why, based off Android? Why, oh. Dream of Electric... Yeah, that's the book version. Oh, is it? Yeah. I didn't know that was the same story at all. Well, I guess I did it at some point, but I, I thought it was like the use and the ideas and took a, told a vastly different story. Well, they might. I don't know. I've never seen Brilliant Runner. I've only read the book. Okay. Okay. So. Well, a better science fiction expert would have to correct us on that. But, I mean, robots are a similar vein, but it is slightly different, but... But yeah, the the question of where does the soul come from? Yeah, and I get uncomfortable with alternate world stories sometimes, and this will probably be a whole other story school of itself sometimes because of that sort of thing. But it's interesting. We talked with Laura Fisher not too long ago. We got to mm-hmm. reconnect with her for a um, uh, previous podcast. I, I got into talking with her. I knew she was a fan of the, uh, the Netflix series Voltron Legendary Defender. Okay, yeah. Voltron TV show, which I had also watched. And she told me she had fallen out of love with it after there was a, a plot line about where one of the main characters, which had been an ongoing mystery that something was weird with him, and then it, it get, gets revealed that uh, at some point in one of the season finales, the character had been captured and then replaced with a clone double of himself. Okay. And the team didn't know it, and it was kind of this plot twist in a later season. That like Secret War sort of thing. Kind of, yeah. Like, oh, this guy has actually been a clone of our friend this whole time. And something that really bothered Laura is that at that point, they kind of chucked all that any like, because this guy had been a part of the team, but they kind of chucked all that out of the window. It's like, nah, no, he's just an evil guy now. And he's, and is as opposed to someone who had been working with the team and acted very much like he cared for them and all this mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And Laura is also, is always very sensitive to character death in one way. But she's, she was like, it really made me feel upset from like a, a more pro life in a way, because like this was an actual person, a whole human clone. Yeah. That's, they just once, they killed him off, and, and they recovered the, the original person back. They didn't have any care anything about yeah. the other person, and it's like, it just felt really weird to her. And I had to admit, I hadn't thought of it that way myself when I had watched it, because I was like, yeah, he's clearly just a bad guy, and here's the good one. And I didn't think too much into it, but that's a valid concern. Well, and spoiler, but that's sort of the, the, the horror of watching um, The End of the Prestige. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, like... They're all real. I don't, it's been a long time I've seen it, but they're all just himself. Yeah. 
he created tons of copies of himself and then immediately killed them all. Yeah. And which is kind messed of up. very messed up. I guess that's Ray Ionami too, isn't it? <laughs> Evangelion, yeah. essentially. So you had this problem with the replacement version where like, that, again, that says it's almost worth less. Like the clone idea is like, and again, science fiction has wrestled this. Do they, are they worth as much as a normal person sort of thing? Well, you know, another interesting place that explores this is actually the Clone Wars TV show. Mm -hmm. Of course, obviously, Star Wars, the Clone Wars was a big deal. And in that case, it wasn't like a body replacement. They just cloned a lot of the one guy. The one guy, like a million times. A million times. Millions of the same dude. But obviously, genetically changed him so that it tended to be much more, like, programmable. Yeah. Except Clone Wars does explore, and I think Rebels also explored this a little bit, how some of them... Even though it's the same guy, kind of develop their own personality depending mm-hmm. on circumstances and which is how it works. Because I, I mean, I think scientifically, generally, things are nature and nurture. Yeah, but it's interesting how how it, it explores how there are some clones that even though they're all programmed to you know execute Order sixty six, yeah, some of them are able to throw off their genetic programming, and there's just there's a few of them, not very many, probably you know just a handful out of all the thousands of thousands of clone yeah. troopers out there. There are a couple that like went into hiding. Nice. I think Commander Cody is the most well known of that. Actually, I'm trying to remember now if if they actually got explored in the Clone Wars show before it got canceled. I mean, there's a new season yeah. of that coming up, or if it's just something that got talked about. He showed up later in Rebels. I'd have to go double check that. But anyway, cool idea for uh, you know Star Wars is typically more science fantasy than science yeah. fiction, but it was fun to see them explore the ramifications of what, what yeah what what makes a clone human yeah and i think that's with the, with this sort of double especially where intersex technology you have a lot if you want you can have a lot of very interesting discussions or you can just say oh we just need to replace this person and you know how tv tends to do it like oh we need robin hood back again or we need <laughs> you know whatever yeah um we need we need we need another timmy to quote dinosaurs oh, okay <laughs> random illusion <laughs> um any more you want to say about that one I don't think so. I mean, Once Upon a Time is probably the strangest version of this that yes. I remember seeing. <laughs> yes. Because it wasn't just Robin Hood. I think they had there was alternate versions of Regina, two different versions of Hook. Yeah, there were lots of them running. I mean, basically, like by the last season, like there's just doubles everywhere. <laughs> it was just ridiculous. It was. I mean, it was fun. Again, for that sort of show, it was just sort of bonkers. They, like, yeah. You don't think too hard. Yeah. No. You know? <laughs> no. When another show, like there might be like deep, what am I? Who am I? My own person, sort of stuff. <laughs> I guess uh, we almost forgot one of the biggest clone stories in pop culture was what happened with Spider Man. Oh, we wish, I wish I know of just from hearing, but I never read it. From I mean, I've only read through the the, the Ultimate Spider Man verse, which I think that was like the last storyline I'd read in Ultimate Spider Man. They condensed it really nicely. From what I understand from like little bit snippets, the Clone Saga with Spider-Man was this ridiculous long storyline I think went on for like five years. And, oh, wow, yeah. And uh, didn't make any sense. They were constantly contradicting themselves about who was, who was in charge of it and stuff like that. But some of the interesting things that came from it was Peter Parker got cloned. And for a long time, it wasn't actually, sh- people weren't sure who was actually the real Peter Parker. Oh, uh, Interesting. And uh, the the uh, the the other one, Ben Riley, I think is what the I think that's the name of what the clone eventually was. Okay, or at sounds least right. The alternate the alternate Peter Parker. I think he eventually decided, you know, I have all the same memories as as Peter, but whether and whether or not I, I think it went back and forth who was the original. But it's like at, at some point, it just said whether or not I'm the original, I'm just gonna have to go live my own life because we there can only be one Peter Parker. Yeah. And it was, again, weird. I mean, that's a weird sacrifice to have to make. And like, I'm not actually who I think I am. And I guess that's an, an interesting thing to pull out of this version of the doubles is what does it mean to be an individual? What it means human, what makes you you? Does sharing memories with somebody make you the same person? I don't think so, but... And the longer you have a, a split double, the more that double becomes its own person. Thing. Yeah, but you I mean, that's that's what happens in Kingdom Hearts. There's yeah. a there's a couple people that are basically doubles of someone else that but the longer that they exist and have their own identity, they become their own person. Exactly. Thank yes, exactly. Just like in real life. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's the the key about all of this. I feel like one reason why I think this is just my own Christian yeah. understanding. 
I think God gives us room to do a lot of experimentation with yeah. science. I've always felt, though, that there's certain doors he probably won't ever let us open yes. <laughs> for for our own good. Yeah, I, I lean that way as well. And then I think the third one is sort of the, I'm going to label the spiritual clone. I don't know. That's what I label. Is that sort of a, you know, the dark version of yourself, the sort of, okay, so there's a book called Descent into Hell by, I forget what's this guy's name, Charles Williams? I think so. We talked about it on one of our previous okay. book club recaps. Oh, I did. Oh, you're right. But anyways, the, there's one lady in it. She keeps seeing far off her doppelganger coming towards her, and it just, it fills her with this terror, this, and if she ever meets this doppelganger, she's sure something horrible is going to happen. That sort of like, sense of like, there shouldn't be someone else wearing my face. But there's also then sort of like the dark, like Dark Link from <laughs> Zelda, where it's like, it's my evil version. The shadow side. The shadow side. Or um, would you say Dr. And Jekyll and Mr. Hyde would fall in that kind of I, category? I, I, I basically would. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wizard of Earthsea, you know, he lets this shadow out that's basically like the shadow evil version of himself. And he has to go basically, he's the only one can tame it, but he, he's the only one that knows its name. I think is kind of how it goes. Mm. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's taken to a certain direction. It can become very yin yangy. It can, and it has been in various forms. Or like, so I just read Win the Door, which is a kind of a sequel to Wrinkle in Time. And there's three, I forget his names, but the principal, then there's two doubles of them. And she has to figure out which one's the real one. And they're, do- they're, they're imitating him on purpose because the whole, kind of one of the themes of the book is kind of like, you are you on purpose. And you have a reason and a role, and a, but there's the evil people are basically saying it's not worth doing anything. You're not special, mm. you know. Let's just x you out. Just it's better to not exist versus your existence. You have a name. You've been named by well, they don't say God, but it's highly implied by God. So there's three of them, and it's interesting. And there's so a lot of this is kind of analyzing either like the split personality inside a person, or like that sort of abyss of even I guess biblically, kind of the, like the Antichrist, you know, like mm-hmm. and like the fake version of you. Like horror movies have this, like there's someone there wearing my face, but it's empty. Yeah. Well, Paul talks about being at war with oneself. Yeah. And I think that's a con very familiar with yeah you know, Christians about my my sinful nature and I don't do what I want to do. And I think even non Christians know that like sometimes who they are is not who they are another day. You know, there's yeah. like a couple oh, yeah. versions of themselves. There's a there's an episode of the original Teen Titans cartoon where they go into Raven's mind. Okay. And uh and inside her mind there's like all these alternate versions of herself. If you don't if you don't know who Raven is, she's like the the goth not even a goth sorceress kind of sorceress magician kind of kind of girl and she's all very like closed off in real life. But you go in your head and like there's like all these different versions of her. Some of them are like really bubbly, some of them are are terrified. There's <laughs> one that's just the the gross one, apparently, that burps and things like okay, that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, it, like, in the, I think it's like Beast Boy and Cyborg, they go in there and they're, they're like really taken aback, having no idea that anyone can have this, or especially Raven of all people could have all these different versions inside mm-hmm. of her. But that's another interesting version of, of this where you encounter different versions, yeah, different parts of yourself. It's like, it's almost a metaphysical clone. Yeah. In some ways. Yeah. Like it's expressing some sort of intangible part of yourself, whether it's this part you want to hide away or, you know, the part you never knew or et cetera. And I think a lot of the older books have this sort of, or or some of that horror version of yourself. There's a book I've not read or a novella called The Double by Dostoevsky, which I think has some of this, like, he sees a guy who looks just like him. There's a Dostoevsky novel you haven't read? I know. That's crazy. There's some of the novellas I have, unfortunately. I, I <laughs> need to. In, like, George McDonald's Fantasties, there's a double running around. I mean, like, it's an older, when they started experimenting with, like, metaphysical sort of, you know, mm. things. Do you think the rise of uh, psychology would have been a factor, too? I, with Dostoevsky, it might have been. I don't know about McDonald. I mean, they okay. were around the same time, I think. Actually, I think McDonald's a little later. Hmm. But he also has a Christian background, so it could have just come from right. Yeah, from that. Paul and Paul and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, that's true. But it's, it, doubles are very interesting just to explore things you don't get. You know, they're they're almost always fanciful in a little bit of a way. You're even the more realistic stuff like Tale of Two Cities is still sort of like pushing the probabilities a little bit. Mm-hmm. Just because it it opens up whole new doors to find someone, because we all think we're the only person like ourselves, and we are. But to kind of 
throw a question mark into that. To be able to step outside yourself and see who am I really and what's what has caused me to be the way that I am. Mm-hmm. The in the um audiobook series I'm reading through right now or going through right now, Superpowers. Oh, yeah. At the end of book two, one of the main characters he had to go through a memory wipe. Okay. And so in book three, he's basically had reverted back to who he was, but he has like vestiges of of the parts okay. that was lost and he's trying to reconnect with them. And by going back, it actually you lose a lot of like experience and yeah. who you are as a person. He's kind of a regression yeah. in a lot of ways, but he doesn't see it at, that way at first. He's like one of these kind of hard nosed characters that had been softened over time. Oh, okay. So for him to go back and see these pe- how people are interacting with him is like, wait, what in the world? <laughs> <laughs> and then there's like, and he has these like dream sequences where in the corner of his mind, there's the old version of himself. Well, the progressed version that's actually much more, that softened in yeah. his perspective, that wants to like reassert itself, uh, which is a really interesting, again, interesting perspective on how time can change you, how your experiences change you, and hopefully make you grow. Yeah. So yeah, just to kind of circle back around, yeah, being able to see a different side of yourself, but then also examining what does it really mean to be yourself, to be yourself, <laughs> to be an individual, to be a to be a soul, essentially. Yeah. And it, obviously, genre fiction works best, but you can use it in almost any genre in in certain ways. Mm-hmm. I mean, the beginning of the Ivy Tree starts off with the sort of like, "Hey, you look just like so and so," which is a book that Tim's supposed to read. Um, <laughs> I have this pile. Okay, <laughs> I got piled by my bed. I'm, I'm so behind on book club stuff. I'm gonna blame the plays, even though there's always things going on. There's always things. Yeah. <laughs> So, anyways, I think that's all we got for that. I think that covers it. I mean, yeah, interesting spectrum. It's not going to come up in every story, but when it does, uh, it's very intriguing. Or, or it can be. All right, let's go to our first soundtrack. Okay, I have the first soundtrack today, so I decided to pick something from The Legend of Zelda Four Swords Adventures which is a game which I have not played because I'm not actually played that much Zelda games. But in this one, Link actually gets split into four versions of himself and he has to go defeats Dark Link, his shadow doppelganger. So So you got clones, doppelgangers? Yeah, yeah. it seems perfect for this You just need a robot. Yeah. (laughs) Mecha Link. Yeah. This remix is uh, called The Electric Flute. It's by Halk. I think it's actually Halsey. Oh, is it Halsey? I thought I read that somewhere, but... I always said Hulk, so I think it'll be fine. They'll be able to find it that way. Hulk, Halsey, one of the two. Yeah. The source song sounds a lot like, I think it may just be a different version of Dark World from uh, Link to the Past. Okay. But from what I understand, Link to the Past and Four Swords have some tie-ins anyway. Oh, interesting. So, uh, but we won't need to get into that now. But this is, uh, this is short and sweet and hope you enjoy.
And we're back. I like that. That was nice and fun and peppy and chippy. Chip tuny. Yep. Yeah, I like I like chip tuny. Yeah, fun stuff. All right, Tim. So uh, we're gonna go into. It came from the interwebs. All right, this is, um, I'm in un- uncharted territory. Usually I'm the one who picks out something for uh, It Came From the yeah, Interwebs. I, I don't normally have anything, but we were doing this this talk about clones and LMDs and stuff and thought got me thinking about a certain topic. So remember once upon a time we watched Sunspring? Do you remember that movie? It was an AI-written script that they filmed. I don't know. I thought you and I watched that. Like, it was been years. Um, but it, on YouTube, it's called Sunspring. Oh, okay. A computer wrote the script after they fed in all this like science fiction films. Yes. Okay. And it's like eight minutes. Come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was okay. it was ridiculous. It okay. was dumb. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Well, anyways, I'm like, we think about all these imitations and clones. I'm like, I wonder if they have something that'll write a story for us online. So there is. If you go to talktotransformer.com. Talk to Transformer. Transformer.com. Apparently, one of the AI companies opened up a, like a mini version that this guy's used. And you can type in just a little bit of a prompt, and it will just start keep writing the story for you. Oh, really? And it's it's funny. So, like, if you go there, you can pick some of their beginning prompts. Like, you can pick, let's pick um, Lord of the Rings. And it starts with, Legolas and Gimli advanced on the orcs, raising their weapons with a harrowing war cry. Okay. And then it generates underneath... Some more of the story. You can read your version. I'll read my version. Okay. Um, Let's see what comes up here. All right. Let's see yours. So, Legolas and Gimli advance into the orcs, raising their weapons with a harrowing war cry. But there is nothing their fiercest commander could do. A pack of orcs had rushed to their assistance and were about to overwhelm them. Then Frodo's eyes flickered with a new understanding. He saw the orcs in their panic had moved their spears and shields from their legs and now threw them against their backs. (laughs) The ground opened up behind him. The ground, the wall, and the orcs all collapsed. <laughs> I'm very confused so far. <laughs> it's okay, Boromir cried out, his face full of hope. It's just a little bit of mud. <laughs> <laughs> so what's great about this is that the AI can put words together in a way that are not non... They're logistically good sentences, but it does not carry meaning well over time. And you get some... My kids were, I showed them this, they're like, do once upon a time, there were two sisters named Mercy and Rennie. Okay. And then I write, and then just write something, and some of the stuff that came up was ridiculous. <laughs> so I thought we'd play with this a little bit. Okay. And then we're going to use this to create a bit of story. Okay. Based on what, the beginnings of one of mine. Okay. I'm intrigued. So what was the, and, uh, well, I'll show you, because they also, it'll also like start writing script. Okay. I, well, well, first we need to hear what, what oh my, your okay, Lord so, of the Rings thing Okay, was. so here's mine. Same beginning. Okay. Okay. Legolas and Gimli advanced on the orcs, raising their weapons with a harrowing cr- war cry. They were soon joined by Boromir, Legolas's cousin. When- <laughs> <laughs> Bor- when the- Boromir is not Legolas's cousin <laughs> yes. now? <laughs> when the two had arrived in the city, they were informed by the city warden, Elheim, that the orcs had breached its walls and surrounded the gates by force. When Gimli tried to persuade them not to retreat, Legolas told him he was not one to give up even a skirmish until faced with the odds. Aolheim? I don't know. <laughs> then ordered the dwarves to open fire on the orcs, prompting the group to fight back against the threat. The war went on for some time until the last orc was killed by the dwarves. This proved to be a great victory for the dwarves, who in addition to the treasure had also cured a great deal of silver. And then it had a little footnote number one. Uh, and then it says, Arrival of Thorin's Company. Come, I will show you the way. Gandalf, as Boromir and his group entered the mines of Moria. Gandalf arrived on the scene a few minutes later. A few minutes after the siege had been broken in by the orcs. Okay. That's all I, I got. I mean, it sounds almost like a story, but like it has, yeah, it lacks any kind of I mean, that worked, feeling. <laughs> that worked better than yours. The, the, the wood, it's just a bit of mud. Yeah. Um, so now you want to see... Try uh, Avengers script. Try that, and then we'll type okay. our own in. The Avengers script. So this is like if you're writing a script. Okay. So it starts with um, Thor. The Tesseract belongs to Asgard. No human is a match for it. Tony turns to leave, but Steve stops him. Steve, you're not going alone. Tony, you going to stop me? Steve, oh no. He grabs Loki's mask off his head. The mask <laughs> falls off and he falls to the ground. Scene, the Avengers fight the Loki guard. The guard is holding a Thor-like shield. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> what does that mean? Is the shield shaped like Thor? <laughs> she gets up from the ground and turns on the shield. 
<laughs> okay, now this is apparently Shield talking. <laughs> it, just, uh, it says Shield. Shield goes up onto the roof. What the hell is going on here? You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Loki guardsman, what? Agent Coulson, I don't trust you. Don't trust anyone ever. So don't trust us. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's amazing. We're all too busy trying to save you. Loki guardsman, do you know why he wants you dead? Coulson, I don't like this. Loki, because you killed my father. <laughs> Oh, that is amazing. So so it's just a lot of fun the t- of feel put in this evening. He put in, once upon a time, there was a Pokemon. That's all we put in. Okay. And then it started talking about, so there's this boy with a red hat named Pikachu. Okay. And eventually he was the champion of a basketball tournament. Um, and then he met his friend Jesse. Like Jesse, you know. Okay, yeah. And yeah. then uh, his mom also had a daughter named Ash. And it was just like <laughs> completely all the names in the wrong order. Yeah, it's it's hilarious. I mean, they fed a lot of stuff into this thing. So you can also go custom prompt and write whatever you want. So I don't know, maybe we should put some... Oh, um, I don't trust you. Don't trust anyone ever. So don't trust us. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> well, thank you, Coulson. Even in this weird, bizarre world, you're still one of the best characters. I feel like we should start... We should find one of our stories and like put the first line in. Yeah, okay. okay. I'm going to real quick put in um, in a galaxy far, far, a uh, long time ago. Okay, yeah, see what you okay, get there. A long time ago in a galaxy. I'm going to grab, far, go grab one of my books, actually. Far away. And put dot, dot, dot and see what happens. Okay. All right, here we go. This is not as interesting as you think it should be. All right. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, there is a small town near the center of the galaxy that is said to harbor a very old castle. <laughs> The castle itself is long abandoned, but its inhabitants are not the least bit shy. It is in the area where the castle is located. Castles in parentheses. Okay. The castle can be accessed from a small passage in the middle of the valley. This path leads down out of the town and goes towards the mountains. The pathway is in various stages of disrepair, and the path is very steep. For the purpose of exploring the castle and taking some photos, it is best to be carrying sturdy and heavy equipment that can be used with both hands, otherwise one falls down. (laughs) At first, your only concern will be finding the path in the middle of the mountain. Once you do, you will probably be able to take a couple pictures. If not, you'll have to travel some more and try again later. (laughs) I like how this became a tutorial. (laughs) The pictures are all taken from the bottom, about 10 feet above ground. So, that's not a very exciting... I'm glad George Lucas did not write that one. Yeah, that's, um, that's bizarre. I'm going to do the first sentence from uh, my novella, New Wells Rising. Ooh, exciting. Available at childrenofthewells.com. Nice. My first sentence is, the glaring rays of a new sun bored into Jason's consciousness, bullying him awake. Then here we go from there. All right, here we go. The boy fell to his knees and began to cry. He did not understand why he felt this way, but he knew that the sun's rays had affected his body. <laughs> Nice. I mean, like, you took a sentence, you could really write a good story off of it. It Yeah. The boy sat up, the sun burning into his skin, but he didn't look like he had gotten much sleep, and he didn't smell like someone had been around. (laughs) (laughs) What? There was no sign of tears running down his face. The boy sat up again, rubbing his eyes. He couldn't remember what had happened. He didn't know anyone who'd been with them. Had he been with them since they had last seen each other? He didn't know. They were all quiet. (laughs) Did they all have jobs? He didn't know. (laughs) They all have jobs. (laughs) He was alone. Jason tried to remember. If it was okay, if it was fine, he just felt bad, then why was he worried that he would die? Then he remembered their last goodbye. He remembered feeling his chest tighten in frustration as they reached the edge of a cliff. Wow. Wow. Dramatic. Very dramatic. Yeah. Yeah, It's (laughs) Wow. So, yeah. I I don't know what the jobs thing was about, but... (laughs) That's fun. All right, so I'm going to put the first paragraph of our last write-up for episode 102. Okay. Including the title and see what happens. So the first paragraph goes like this. Episode 102, character developing. Please wait. A wise and weird man once said, My, my, this here Anakin guy may be Vader someday later. Now he's just a small fry. Which raises the important question. How? How does a village coward become a brave knight? How does a fussy old hobbit become an adventurer? Or, in other words, how does the character change? Tim and Nick delve into the depths of character development, hoping to find some answers. That's what I wrote. So here's what happens. After that. I'll be here for the longest time, 
If one had made a choice in a duel between Darth Vader and Kenobi as to who would survive to see one day die, the outcome would have been different. Vader would have won, Kenobi would have died, and Luke would have been left alone in the darkness. I'm sure Vader would rather have escaped with a few seconds to spare, but how did you actually make that decision? We'll go to the source of choice and the most controversial part of George Lucas's original script. <laughs> how did they know about our podcast? <laughs> and guess what? We get some insight into Lucas's thinking and his, and they just, and just hits the word limit. Gets a hits word limit. I'm amazed they managed to pull off the Star Wars reference. Oh, because you, you mentioned Anakin. Anakin. Okay. Yeah. Anakin, and so it just that's... went it went nuts on that. Okay, I gotcha. What's great if you just hit generate again with the same thing, you'll get something completely different. But oh, whoa. Okay, real quick. So if I do it again, it says, and yes, they really do talk about the Lord of the Rings movie. Just to say it's out there on the internet. You can catch us on Twitter at Nick Danick <laughs> and Tim Danick with a link to the site www.timdanick.com as well as the Facebook group The Raging Nerd. What? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we apparently have new Twitter handles. Oh, okay. Uh, your original did have our names in it, your original paragraph. Yeah, but they made up Twitter handles for us. For us, yeah, okay. I've, I've seen it before where we'll give a, like, a YouTube short link, uh, and I type in it, it doesn't go to anything. It's just completely made up. <laughs> our Facebook group, The Raging Nerd. The Raging Nerd, yes. Uh, not sure what to say to that. Let's hear, let's hear this, Tim. What do you got? Okay, so I, since you said you could generate two, I thought, you know what, let's use that same sentence again, because yeah. that one seemed fairly obvious from the, like, the waking up, and yeah. let's see if this gets different, so... The glaring rays of a new sun bored into Jason's consciousness, bullying him awake. She rolled over on her side, her legs dangling above the bedroll. What did I get myself into? Her voice, soft as ever, made him squirm against it before he managed to escape to get her to stop wiggling. You got a girl. She's pregnant. She'll, <laughs> uh, this took a very different turn. <laughs> She'll need to be at work in an hour or two. She was smiling, but she looked pain. Can I call her? I want to keep her company for a bit. Who are we talking about here? I'm really confused. <laughs> the, the, the pronouns get very messed up after a while. I also haven't seen her in ages, and I've never been to a hotel before in her life. <laughs> in her life. I've never been to a hotel before in her life. I've missed you too, baby. <laughs> yeah, I've missed you too. I hope you're feeling better. I am and I will, JC. I'm happy to be here. Jason smiled and tucked the man's scarf back into his back pocket before she began snoring gently, just as quietly as she'd done earlier. She knew that he was just as excited. He was also the last guy she... It's like living in like some sort of like half-conscious dream state. <laughs> I like that they gave Jason the nickname JC, like <laughs> J-A-S-I. That's actually kind of creative. It, it does some interesting things. Like, it's not quite coherent, but it's smarter than you think it should be. Yeah. That is wild. So, I'm going to do one more, and then I think... Oh, well, you know, Tim, we should do your shirt. Oh, <laughs> I'm wearing a shirt with a Babylon 5 quote on it. But And then I think what we should do on full scale, we'll take the beginning one of our of Flesh Fiction, just keep keep adding to it till it gets to about three, 400 words, read the full story, and then read the real one, and we'll, we'll see how the clones compare to each other. Okay. I, I thought that might be an interesting comparison, see how the, how the robot does for a fuller length story. Okay. So I did a, It Was a Dark and Stormy Night. Uh-huh. It was a dark and stormy night. In the darkness and the gloom, it looked like the town was deserted. Now, this is a good start. The town was completely deserted by 6 p.m., but a few of the merchants had already gone out to sell their own items. This was one of the biggest selling points of the towns. Not only would they sell a lot of goods, they would sell them at a lower price. The reason being that the town had the ability to create their own items. Thus, they were selling what they made in their town at an affordable price. Okay, we're going to just... <laughs> <laughs> the darkest story of night just turned into a merchant story. Apparently. That's interesting. A little... So a young lady later, who had the eyes on the crowd, came closer. Are you looking for some money? Even if I sell my wares to you, you will never know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, that is not, not good. It didn't, yeah, it didn't quite connect. But um, So, yeah, my shirt has a Babylon 5 quote. If you go to Zaha Doom, you will die. And we're continuing on from there. Okay. You will die, at least until your family can pay you off. <laughs> in, in Zaha Doom, you are given a reward from the queen, and you will leave to find yourself in the other afterlife. Zaha Doom is the word used for the afterlife, the second world, and the other afterlife. <laughs> okay. Then it has a, the subtitle, Dawn's End. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. When you go to the second afterlife, you need to take the dark sign out of your pocket. 
It seems you're unable to find it at the moment. Once you have it at hand, you will need to take it on an altar to restore it to its proper power again. You can now see what time and date it is now, and its <laughs> name is the Dawn's End. You will be put in the same limbo in which you had passed this before, but it was just before the events of the previous life, and it's now before you. <laughs> that is an amazing sentence right there. You can Conjugate see. that. I mean, <laughs> diagram that. <laughs> diagram that sentence. You can see the past or the future, and you can't do anything, but you cannot control yourself. <laughs> this is... Some of the this some is, of that is like it could be like the beginning of a nice like game or like yeah it, it sounds like yeah like a walkthrough for a video game <laughs> it does either that or something from Kingdom Hearts I don't know <laughs> <laughs> all right Sam so here's what I think we do okay we're going to take the beginning of one of my flesh fictions okay and we're going to run it through the machine all right and then the last paragraph of what we get we're going to throw back into the machine until we get a, a longer story. Okay, so we're having this thing, right, not just an excerpt of a story, but an actual or, flash fiction or is, size. Uh, 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 yeah, a couple hundred words. Okay. And okay. we'll see. Obviously, it's not going to fool anyone, but I think it'd be fun to read what the computer gets out of it and then what it should have been. Okay, what the so, original flash fiction was. What the original flash fiction was. So, you got one picked out? Yes. All right, then let's do a bit of story. Tim, this is called Heavenly Music. Heavenly Music. And we are starting off with our computer-generated one. All right, guys. So this is what the computer came up with. The conductor was repeating some last-minute reminders, but Stanley didn't hear a word. He was distracted, preparing himself mentally for his next performance. He had always participated in band in high school, and he was the first to defend the importance of art in an argument. Plus, this was a paying gig. But Stanley needed to see the show. He wanted to be there to help in some way. Stanley stood up and took his cello and left the room. He opened the door to his room. He was sure his room looked the same as it had always been when he was younger. There was the same picture of him performing under his belt on the wall that showed that he was very proud of being a successful musician. In the middle of the photo was a framed copy of a book he had read and liked. In the corner was a drawing of that same picture with a different guitar and a couple of different people in it. Stanley paused in his room as he wondered if he'd gotten in any trouble. He was only four years older than the boy he had been trying to kill and had been <laughs> years of being afraid to come out. He had thought of telling him, but he was scared of how that would affect his life and if he made him worry that it would ruin things for the both of them. So far, he wasn't had felt much in the way of a panic attack. He remembered being in a hospital, and the way he had been brought there had been horrifying. But he had been able to get out of there and go to a friend's house who he had talked to and had calmed down when he had tried to go to sleep, and he hadn't had that experience when he was in the hospital. <laughs> he had never done anything stupid in his entire life, but he wasn't ready to make such a commitment before tonight. <laughs> <clears throat> professional he had been thinking about it some more before he left and he had found out that he could do things <laughs> he could do things <laughs> he could move even if it would be painful he started his journey out and a couple of minutes after he left the house he saw a group of people who were waiting to take him with them he walked to the door knocked on it and stood there come on come to me he said he was alone the sky was completely dark and dark. <laughs> <laughs> Someone didn't proofread. <laughs> no. <laughs> he had not even reached the third floor. I thought he was still outside. <laughs> he moved me when it hurts, Tim. <laughs> he opened the door and stepped inside. It was like he had walked into a dream. The only thing about this place was the sound of the waves that ran inside the house. <laughs> it was completely strange, even though it would not be strange to anyone. The end. The end. Or at least where we decided to end it. So we were just like, okay, we're done there. So this it's what's fascinating about this is that like it gravitates to certain details and it will not let them go. <laughs> like the book that's framed and 
Yeah. It definitely feels like that computer that like has some idea of what it means to be a person, but not really. <laughs> Or some some idea of how to write a book, but not really. I, I feel like this is some books you might get from like middle school, like middle schoolers that like are just they're like I just gonna write whatever comes to my head, sort of thing. I'll take your word for it, but <laughs> but yeah, like certain like sentences by themselves might make sense. I mean, if it's not something saying something completely insane, like the sky was completely dark and dark. Yeah, but like other things, like I can picture that that sentence in the book, but not like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, then the way we did it, it tended to, say we just use the last paragraph to make the next paragraph, it lost a train of thought of music and yeah, stuff like that. Rehearsing. And which was kind of, I mean, he was going to kill a guy, I guess. And then- <laughs> And then forgot all about he it. He forgot about it, and he was, he had powers. <laughs> yes. Okay, so right. let's read your actual story. So let's go me. to a bit of story. I didn't know we were going to have to put the intro in here twice. <laughs> it thought that'd be fun. You don't have to. But. You have it up? I have it up. You want me to read it? Uh, go ahead. This is your story, actually. Okay, I'm going to actually... All. all right. Heavenly music. The conductor was repeating some last-minute reminders, but Stanley didn't hear a word. He was distracted, preparing himself mentally for his next performance. He had always participated in band in high school, and he was the first to defend the importance of art in an argument. Plus, this was a paying gig. The conductor flung open the door. The roar of wind drew Stanley from his thoughts. Everyone, pay attention. We only have one chance to get this right. Each and every one of you is about to make history. Stanley shifted uncomfortably in his seat. The pack made him feel bulky. He had practiced playing with it on, but still, this concert would be different, that's for sure. The conductor hadn't gotten an NEA grant for nothing. Okay, it's about time, everyone. To your feet. You'll go at my command. Now, Piccolo, go, go. Cynthia Martin. Stanley borrowed a piece of gum from her at the first meeting. Nice girl. She jumped out of the plane. When she pulled her chute, she was supposed to start playing Flight of the Bumblebee. Come on, string quartet. You're next. Let this cello go first. Quick, one after another. Each wave of musicians formed a more complex arrangement each a new phase of a dramatic art being caught on film by cameramen jumping with the groups. Stanley was a trumpeter in the brass section. Watching the five-piece jazz band plummet out of the plane, Stanley began to wonder if there were better ways of making a quick $500, like donating plasma, maybe. Of course, he hated needles almost as much as he hated heights. Okay, last group, grand finale. Make me proud, people. Go, go, go. Stanley was flung out of the plane after the trombonist. He reached for his cord and pulled. Nothing. He tried again. Nothing. All around him, parachutes billowed out of packs. He could hear the first rousing notes of Ride of the Valkyries as he continued down at unbelievable speed. He had been drilled. Nothing was more important than this piece of art. So with one hand, he tugged the cord again and again. With the other, he raised his trumpet to his lips and began to play. It was not his best performance. The wind flung him side to side and around in circles. He struggled to keep his rhythm. He was used to tapping his foot. A squeal shot from the trumpet as Stanley twisted to see the ground fast approaching. In a sudden revelation, he remembered the emergency cord. His bone jarred beneath the force of the parachute as it filled with air. He crashed into trees, broke branches, hit the ground. He was rushed to the hospital. When his girlfriend was finally allowed to see him, she was so angry she wanted to break a few more of his bones. What happened? she demanded. You ruined the whole work. Well, Stanley said apologetically, you know I always had a tendency to play a little flat. Womp, womp, womp. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's it's a ridiculous story, which is when I thought when I realized this was going to be a ridiculous exercise, I thought, okay, that, that's a just a fun one to go out with, and and no computers writing that story. <laughs> no, no, no computer come up with that. Only from the mind of Nick Hayden. <laughs> It's what it means to be an individual. <laughs> there you go. Interesting. Uh, interesting. A visual example, well, not visual for the people listening, I guess, but uh, yeah, G interesting way to illustrate this. Yes, yes. So I guess we might as well start getting out here. I th think we're descending. Um, Sounds like we're going down. And I'm a little worried because there's some people coming in that have guns and things. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we decided to kind of hide in this corner over yeah. here, uh, out of the way of things. Hopefully they're not suspicious or anything. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure this. I'm sure this will go fine. Yeah, Man, yeah. They really are in like suits and. Man, that one girl, she's packing some heat. Yeah, yeah, this is going to be... 
Okay. Okay. Let's 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 get let's, out here quietly. Okay. We'll wrap this up. Thanks for listening, folks, to Derailed Trains of Thought. You can find us on iTunes and Stitcher and Spotify now. Oh, we're on Spotify, finally. So go stream us while you run, while you sleep, while you do dishes, while you do everything. We're available here for you yeah. on the interwebs. Yes. Okay, for my uh, soundtrack, I decided to take a remix of the Angels of S.H.I.E.L.D. theme song. This is remixed by Stiz Mask, um, and it's kind of just fun. So <laughs> Cool enjoy. stuff. Cool stuff, yes. All right, well then, All Tim. Right. We're trying to keep our voices down, folks, but uh, we hope you remember to like us on Facebook and all that stuff. Uh, I guess we already covered that. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. This has been Tim. This is Nick. Bye-bye. Adios.